Welcome everyone to this webinar. My name is Rebecca Choate. I'm Associate for Global Advocacy and Education at Global Ministries of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and the United Church of Christ. Um, we want to welcome you to this webinar and just a couple of quick notes before we get started. Um, if you have any questions for um, Dr. Sabra during his presentation, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The chat function is turned off so that will be the only place in which questions uh, can be put so please uh, type those in during the presentation and then uh, once this presentation is over we will get those answered uh, and have the opportunity to ha have some more discussion at that point uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will be posting the recording uh, by the end of the week on our website. We will also be sending an email out to everyone who registered for the webinar with the link to um, uh, with the link to the, the recording, as well as any other links that are shared during this time. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Peter McCary, our area executive for the Middle East and Europe. Uh, Peter, take it away. Thank you very much, Becca, and welcome to all of our viewers today on this special webinar, the Near East School of Theology, the future of a theological seminary in a failing state and a turbulent Middle East. My name is Peter McCary, and I serve as executive for the Middle East and Europe in Global Ministries of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and United Church of Christ. I'm so glad that you have decided to spend this hour with us to listen, to learn, and to engage. In October 2019, large numbers of Lebanese turned out ostensibly to demonstrate against the government's imposition of new taxes on such things as gasoline and even on WhatsApp. But there was much more behind the demonstrations, notably the worsening financial and economic situation in Lebanon and a political crisis. Then this spring, COVID-19 hit and Lebanon's people, plus the refugees in Lebanon from Palestine and Syria were impacted by restrictions and lockdowns to attempt to contain the virus. While the economic and political crises have persisted, so has popular discontent. Then just over three months ago on October 4th, a major, on August 4th, a major explosion at the Beirut port devastated major sections of the city and was felt throughout the country and even as far away as Cyprus. Many of our church partners were affected by the blast, including the Near East School of Theology, which was in the process of preparing for the beginning of the 2020-2021 academic year. The explosions left more than 200 people dead 6,500 injured and more than 300,000 people homeless, putting immense pressure on the healthcare system already overburdened by the rising numbers of cases of the coronavirus. In our webinar today, Dr. George Sabra, president of the Near East School of Theology, known familiarly as NEST, will offer his perspectives on theological education in the Middle East and Lebanon and the context in which NEST finds itself today. The Near East School of Theology, a partner of the United Church of Christ and Christian Church Disciples of Christ through Global Ministries, was established in 1932 with roots in the Congregational and Presbyterian Mission in the, in the Middle East, going back to 1835. NEST is located in Beirut, where it prepares students for ministry throughout the Middle East. An ecumenical Protestant seminary, its constituent churches include the Union of Armenian Evangelical Churches in the Near East, the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, and the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem. Dr. Sabra has served as NEST president since 2012. Native Beiruti, Dr. Sabra received his Bachelor of Philosophy from the American University in Beirut and his Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. He has also received a Master of Arts in Medieval Studies from the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies. In 1986, he was awarded the Doctor of Theology from the Faculty of Theology in the University of Tübingen, Germany. Dr. Sabra is currently Professor of Systematic Theology at NEST, as well as serving as President, and has also been a lecturer at the American University of Beirut and other universities in Lebanon. He is the author, editor, and translator of several books and articles in the fields of theology, ecumenism, Middle Eastern Christianity, and Christian-Muslim dialogue. And he wrote the book, Truth and Service, which is a history of NEST and of Protestant theological education 
in the region. As Becca mentioned, following Dr. Dr. Sabra's presentation, Becca will moderate your questions, which you can enter into the chat in the bottom of your Zoom screen. Welcome, Dr. Sabra. We are delighted for your presence with us today. Thank you, uh, Peter. Let's make sure the PowerPoint gets on here, yes. Thank you very much for the introduction and also thank you for organizing this uh, webinar. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Reverend Fahad Abu Akil. Actually, it was his or originally his idea to organize such a webinar. So thanks to both of you and I'm very honored to be with you <clears throat> and to have so many people, uh, so many old friends, not old, old and current friends um, participating. Let me uh, be begin by saying, uh, and uh, many of you know this, of course, but that the NEST, uh, the Near East School of Theology, in its present structure and uh, constitution today is 88 years old. But as a theological seminary in, in Lebanon, it is actually much older. 2020 is the 151st anniversary of uh, the theological seminary in Lebanon. It's one of the oldest institutions of higher learning in the country of Lebanon, founded in 1869, second only to the American University of Beirut, which was founded in 1866 by the same Board of Missions. Throughout its life uh, of a century and a half, it has faced many crises and difficulties. Uh, World War I and the huge famine that swept over Lebanon in those war years, the struggle for the independence of Lebanon and Syria, the many Arab-Israeli wars, 1948, 67, 73, the devastating war in Lebanon from 1975 to 1990 and its aftermath, and all the political turbulence and instability in Lebanon and the immediate regions of Syria, Palestine, Iraq, and Jordan. The seminary survived all this, although at times it had to close down temporarily. At others, it had to change identity and constitution, like when it changed from the theological seminary to the Beirut School for Religious Workers in the early 1920s. And then again in 1932, it changed identity to the Near East School of Theology when it merged with a seminary coming from Turkey via Athens. Today, we find ourselves facing a major crisis or crises in the plural, not unlike some of the major ones faced in the past, perhaps even bigger, more radical and more dangerous. In 2020, NEST has received three major blows that have threatened its very existence and mission the economic and financial and monetary collapse of Lebanon, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the Beirut Harbor explosion of August 4. These three blows are still beating at our country. They have shaken the foundations and seriously threatened many institutions in the country. They have uh, led some institutions to close down, many of them educational institutions, <clears throat> schools and universities. And in some cases, these blows have knocked out some institutions. Allow me to say a few words about each one of these blows. First, the economic and financial crisis. In October 2019, to be precise, on the 17th of October, widespread protests flared up throughout Lebanon against the corrupt political class that has been ruling the country for decades. That was the signal, or rather the exposure, of the collapse of the economy and the financial system of this country. It had been brewing for a while, but it finally exploded, exploded in October 2019, and things have been going downhill ever since. It's a long and complicated story, what happened that led up to this collapse, but put in the words of a researcher whom I'm quoting here, it's the following. I quote, the, the defrauding of the state and the people through a borrow and steal scheme has been underway for three decades 
and reach unprecedented proportions in the last few years when banks began lending money from people's savings to finance the government only to have them looted. I don't have time to elaborate on all the details of the uh, crisis, but the end result is most of our money, especially the, one in, the ones in, in, in hard currency, uh, are basically confiscated by our banks. We have no access to them. The loss of value of the Lebanese pound by over 80%. The rise in prices of everything. The inability to import necessary foods, goods, medications, medical equipment, anything that is imported from outside has become extremely expensive and thus either rare to find or not available at all. The closure of institutions and shops, it's reported that one third of the jobs in the private sector have been canceled. Among them 100,000 in the tourism industry, tourism industry which is so important for Lebanon. A growing rate of unemployment, over 40% unemployment. The growth of the poverty line to encompass more than 55% of the Lebanese people, with 25% at extreme poverty. A huge national debt, etc., etc. Lebanon is in a terrible shape economically and financially, and therefore also socially and politically and vice versa. This has not stopped. It's getting worse. The same corrupt ruling class is still in power. They are supposed to reform and put forth solutions for the collapse, which they themselves created and caused. They are supposed to form a government now. They haven't been able to do so because they are fighting over who gets what. And by the way, NEST students also participated in the protests back in October and November. Now add to this that the most poli powerful political power in the country is today a political, military, and religious party with a pro-Iranian ideology for whom Lebanon and the interest of Lebanon do not come first, but allegiance to Iran and its religious and political ideology and interests in the region come first. And this powerful and political and military force forms like something of a state within a state and runs an army parallel to the Lebanese army and has its own foreign policy and intervenes in wars and conflicts in the region without the consent of the constitutional, constitutional institutions. This powerful pro-Iranian political power is one of the reasons, but it's not the only one, why the revolution or the uprising of October 17 could not, against the corrupt political class, could not until now achieve any tangible results. The pro-Iranian party defends the interests of the corrupt ruling class. Thus, it has been basically against the popular protest, despite rhetoric to the contrary, and at many points even attacked the protesters physically. The irony is that the popular support for this political party and its allies comes from a majority of poor people who are suffering under the economic collapse and the corruption of the government and the whole ruling class like others. But what really motivated them was not the socioeconomic factor, but the religious and confessional drive. If you need anything uh, much uh, more uh, vivid, uh, more vivid refutation of Marxist philosophy and anthropology, this is it. In the midst of all this political, social, economic financial crisis is Nest. Nest is in Lebanon. The second, <clears throat> on top of all this, by January and February 2020, the COVID-19 virus started spreading in the country, and we had to go through closures and lockdowns and strict measures that also further devastated the economy and negatively affected other aspects of life. And this has been increasing after an initial stage of what we thought was a successful uh, Lebanese handling of the virus situation. Now things are deteriorating further on this front. And Nest is in Lebanon, in the midst of this pandemic situation, and there is no end to it yet. The majority of schools and universities started the academic year online. 
Nest was the exception. We have a small number of students this year due to all these developments. And so we started the academic year in late September teaching in person. It worked until a few days ago when a new general lockdown was declared and everything had to close down again. We are in the midst of it right now. So we are back to teaching online for the next two weeks. Of course, we do so under very strict measures. We teach, learn and work with a vicious virus hanging over our heads and lurking at our doors. Here you see some students. This is what a classroom looks like uh, these days or a few, maybe a week ago when there was no lockdown. And here we are in chapel also. We're learning to, uh, to, to sing hymns with masks on. And third, as though all this was not enough, thirdly, we get the horrendous explosion of the Beirut port on August 4th. As Peter mentioned, around 200 dead, 6,000 injured, 300,000 displaced, 90,000 residential units partially or completely destroyed, the devastation is huge. The economic loss as a result of the explosion is estimated at about $4 billion. And of course, Nest got its share. Some of you have seen these pictures before. Not one floor survived broken glass, windows, doors, false ceilings, etc. But thank God, no one was hurt. There were very few people in the building on the evening of August 4. In fact, 11 only in a building which normally has about 60 or 70. But staff of NEST and students who live in uh, neighboring uh, areas or in Beirut area suffered damage in their homes too. Thank God also for the friends and supporters of NEST all over the world. And here I would like to take this opportunity to thank um, all those who came to our aid, some of you are listening right now and donated money for repair and reconstruction or restoration. I never really knew how well known and well loved and well appreciated Nest was until this explosion hit us. Hundreds of emails of support and generous donations to help us repair and stand up on our feet again came pouring upon us. And so we were able to repair relatively quickly and what remains will be repaired soon. But we were able to resume our operation normally. The proof is that we started the academic year on time in late September and according to schedule. Now, the impact of these three blows on NEST has been, just headlines, a reduction of the number of students from the region and uh, from abroad. Cancellation of many of our programs and activities that had been planned for the summer 2020 and also for the academic year 2021, such as continuing education programs, workshops, study seminars, sabbatical for pastors, etc. Public lectures. Loss of residents in our building. Residents are students who go to other universities, but they live here. Most universities are operating online, so uh, they don't rent rooms here anymore, and this means loss of income for us. Of course, the loss of the value of our national currency affected the salaries of staff and faculty. These have lost 80% of their value. The rise in prices of everything necessary for the upkeep and maintenance of this building and its services, food, repairs, but also purchase of books and resources for the library, online subscriptions in databases and journals and periodicals. All these have become very expensive as they require payments in hard currency. Difficult times lie ahead of us, not just behind us. And we are as unsure about the course to take as everybody else in this failing and seemingly dying country. The biggest blow among these three is, of course, that of the economic and financial collapse of the country, along with the political crisis. If the country keeps sliding into the abyss, there is no telling what will happen to an institution like ours. 
What does not help either is the situation of our churches. We are a seminary that is an arm of the Protestant churches of the region. We are the seminary serving the four Protestant churches of the region, which uh, Peter named at the beginning. Here they are listed. The Arab Presbyterians of Syria and Lebanon, the Armenian Congregationalists of the whole New Near East, the Episcopalians of the Diocese of Jerusalem, and the Lutherans of the Holy Land and Jordan. Our faith and our future as an institution of theological education and ministerial training depends directly and primarily on their situation and their well-being. These are the historic and ecumenical Protestant and evangelical churches in our region today. And we have to be frank and honest with ourselves and before God, things are not well with our churches or if you pre prefer with Protestant presence in our region. Our churches are not growing. They're not even just maintaining themselves. They are being reduced in numbers as immigration and spiritual apathy hits them due to all that is happening in our countries. Young people are not drawn to the church, let alone to full commitment to serving the church and God's people. All our churches suffer from lack of, or at least extreme dearth of vocations. The reasons are many, spiritual, cultural, economic, political, etc. This is not the place to go into the reasons in detail, in fact, I will be putting a proposal before our faculty soon to embark on a major research project mapping the present state of our Protestant communities in the Middle East, Near East, beginning with Lebanon and Syria at the first stage, in order to go deeper, deeper into our actual situation and its challenges and future. One thing that strikes me about our situation in Lebanon and the region is a comparison with other places in the world where there have been crises and wars and upheavals. For example, Europe immediately after World War II, there was a surge in people going into theology, to seminaries and faculties of theology after World War II, especially in Germany, for example. After so much suffering and destruction, violence, death and devastation, many turned to religion to try to find answers for the meaning of life, Many turned to religion uh, to serve the causes of peace and justice through the mission of the church and faith. Not so in Lebanon and Syria. Young people who have experienced wars and conflicts or who are now experiencing severe economic, social and political upheavals are not turning to the seminary or to the pursuit of theology as a response nor are they turning to the church and seminary as a vocation. If anything, they are turning away from church and religion or are becoming increasingly indifferent to them. This is a matter that needs study and reflection. One wonders, is it because many of our conflicts, crises and problems in this region of the world are either essentially religious, sectarian at bottom, or are always imbued with religious and sectarian factors? Is it because people, especially young people, are fed up with so much religion that shapes everything in their lives, not only their personal lives, but their social, political, and even economic lives in the larger society? And at any rate, and excuse this digression, the end result is that there are very few vocations candidates for the ministry in our churches in Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Jordan today. And our seminary consequently finds itself with steadily decreasing numbers of full-time students. The Near East School of Theology was founded in the first place to prepare candidates for the ministry and for Christian education in the main Protestant churches in the region. Its core number of students came from those churches as sent and sponsored by those churches. In the Middle East, and this applies to all churches, Protestant, Orthodox, and Catholic, you don't go to seminary or you don't study theology, get a degree, and then look for a position in a church. You have to be already chosen, sent by a church. Very few are those who pursue a degree in theology on their own, and if they do, they are usually not aiming for service in the church. 
We are at a time now when there are hardly any candidates for the ministry or for Christian education from the churches that NEST traditionally serves. That is our biggest challenge. There are so many other things that NEST does, of course, besides ministerial training, for example, ecumenical dialogue, continuing education, workshops, seminars for the churches, preserving Protestant heritage, publications, public theological education, Christian-Muslim dialogue. But all of these are offshoots and extracurricular activities and programs and further tasks of an institution that is essentially dedicated to theological education and ministerial training, the seminary. Seminary is the bearer of these activities and programs and not the other way around. Where does this leave us as far as this future of our institution is concerned? Obviously in a very difficult situation. Unless the churches here replenish the seminary with students, a core number of full-time students, which would enable us to continue our task and mission along with all the other activities and programs that NEST does, then I believe we have to look for a more radical way out of which uh, way out, which might require a change of identity. We will still work on increasing the number of students from the region, but we also have to contemplate perhaps changing identity. In fact, ever since the consultation on the future of NEST, which was held in 2012 when I was appointed president, I have been pointing our board in the direction of a change of identity. What do I mean by that? I personally realized many years ago that things cannot continue as they are. Student numbers are not going to increase dramatically. The needs of the churches for pastors and educators are not going to increase. We need to associate more closely with other institutions of higher learning. At first, I suggested closer collaboration with other universities. Then it became gradually clear to me <clears throat> that closer collaboration, joint programs and activities are not enough. A more radical step has to be considered. We need to think about NEST affiliating institutionally, if not merging with another university in the country. Our board of managers, upon my suggestion, formed a committee to discuss these options but things have not progressed much. There is still strong reservation and heavy reluctance to change the structure and shape of the institution. I believe we stand at a critical juncture as our predecessors did in the late 1920s and early 1930s when they re-established the seminary by a merger of two institutions, the Beirut School of Religious Workers and the School of Religion in Athens to become a third thing the Near East School of Theology. Now is perhaps the time for considering a new merger, not with another seminary, for this possibility does not exist in Lebanon, but with a university to become the School of Theology and Religion of that university. Details of the merger could be discussed at length and are open to much discussion, but the idea needs to be seriously entertained that it is perhaps time to reinvent NEST. A merger or affiliation with another institution of higher learning would certainly provide NEST with more students in its courses. NEST would be able to reach students of other disciplines in that institution and thus have a, fi a, fi a wider audience for theological and religious knowledge and education. NEST would also have to expand its academic offerings beyond the purely theological curriculum to cover some areas of religious studies, comparative religion and philosophy of religion. NEST already does some, does some of that for its own students. We have courses on Islam and Christian Muslim relations, world religions, philosophy of religion, but it could build on those and develop in accordance with the need of the institution in question. This option would also contribute much towards relieving some of the financial burden that, burden that is increasingly resulting from full-time salary faculty. The advantages of a merger are numerous, but that would require a radical change in the identity and structure of NEST. Are we ready for it? Of course, it does not all depend on us. Given the present economic and financial crisis that is affecting all sectors of the country, 
including, of course, the educational sector, we may not be able to find a partner anymore for this project. Things were much easier a couple of years ago. But still, we have to think seriously about this option and try to see if it can work. But let me end by saying that facing crises is never just a matter of finding the right economic and social and political path to follow or measures to adopt. For us as a theological seminary, there must be a spiritual will to fight, to resist, to withstand. Those of us who are still here are not about to give up and go. As I told our students and the whole NEST community at the opening convocation this year, we cannot be like those who live without hope or without the conviction that life and history have meaning and have purpose. We belong to an ecclesial institution which shows a motto for its mission and put it on its theological periodical, the Nest Theological Review. This is the verse from 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Let light shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We are entrusted with this light and we cannot keep it shining. We cannot but keep it shining. Yet it is at times like these that we realize how vulnerable and threatened and weak and fragile these earthen vessels are, namely we and our situation. But that, as the apostle tells us, is to teach us that the power belongs to God, not to us. So I told our community, let our guiding thought for this academic year be what the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians about how Christians in whose hearts the light of Christ shines, how they live in the midst of trials and difficulties of this life. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Afflicted, depressed, perplexed, confused, persecuted, surrounded by negativity, these are the marks of our lives today, here in this very country and region. We see nothing positive on the horizon. We don't understand what is happening around us or why. We wonder anxiously about the future. How can this be happening to us? How come our world just crumbled around us while, while we were making other plans. What Paul describes here is precisely the situation of life in our Lebanon today. But Christian life does not stop here. It introduces a preposition, a conjunction, and a negation, but not. Afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. It's this negative conjunction that gives meaning and value to our lives as Christians. Without it, we would be crushed, desperate, forsaken, destroyed. Without it, the three blows of 2020 would have knocked us out already. But thanks be to God who never forsakes us, and thanks be to our friends and partners all over the world who are standing beside us, praying for us, and supporting us morally and materially. It is not the first severe crisis we are facing, nor will it be the last. The important thing is never to lose faith and hope, for our God is the Lord who creates out of nothing and raises the dead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sabra. It's a great presentation. Um, if you would stop sharing your screen, please, so then we can see both of us together. We have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, the first one you mentioned, you talked about Nest's constituent churches. Um, Ed Taylor's asking if you have an academic relationship with the Maronite tradition. Yes, well, uh, definitely. We have uh, very good relations and institutional relations with all uh, Christian seminaries in Lebanon and the whole Middle East through something called the Association of Theological Institutes in the Middle East. This is a branch of the Middle East Council of Churches, uh, and this has been going on for uh, over 35, 40 years or so. 
and we cooperate with Maronites and others uh, in, in this association. Um, there is a question from Fahed about uh, how, in the past, um, your student body came from how many different nations or countries? Uh, in the past, it was, of course, um, uh, many of the countries of the of the Middle East: uh, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, uh, Palestine, uh, Iraq, uh, Iran, uh, and Armenia. And we still have students from Armenia too. Um, but we also had a lot from uh, East Africa uh, for many, many years. But um, now, for the last uh, seven or ten years or so. We don't receive students from East Africa anymore. They have their own seminaries, and it has also become extremely difficult for people from Sudan uh, to be given visas to enter Lebanon to, to study. Uh, but we have expanded the student body, to, and we are running programs with uh, other countries, uh, European, Western countries also, to, for students to come and uh, not take a whole degree here, but spend a year getting to know uh, Christian churches and Christian Muslim relations. Uh, and that leads into another question that Fahed has. Do you have training for lay leadership at all? Well, in, in some of our um, workshops and seminars organized by our uh, resource center for Christian education, there's a lot of training that goes on for lay leaders. And one of our degrees is also, um, it's called Diploma in Theological Studies which is about eight courses or so, it is specially designed for lay people in the churches who don't want to have a, don't want to be ordained or want to work full time in the church, but want to have some uh, theological knowledge. Uh, we have a question from Pauline who wants to know a little bit more about your proposed research project that you mentioned. Um, if you could talk about maybe any hoped for outcomes in particular. Well, um, I mean, it's it's um, it's going to, it's going to need the, a team of, of workers and of course some uh, funding, and it, it can't be undertaken right now with all the uh, measures that uh, hamper people moving not only inside Lebanon but we can't even go to Syria. But eventually, we want to start this so that we we don't really know exactly uh, what is the. Uh, what is the situation in all our churches? What are the numbers of people, young people? We need a lot of statistics uh, about uh, who is still there on the ground, uh, who, how many people show up in, in church, uh, what do people understand by their Protestant identity? All of this has to be studied and, and mapped so that we know what, what does it mean to, to say that there is Protestant presence in, in, in some of our uh, countries. You know, in a country like Lebanon, I'm sure many of you know, there are no official statistics about anything because it's a very dangerous political game. So we don't actually know how many Protestants are in Lebanon. Uh, people make guesses, you know, but even a simple question like this, which is usually answered by a census of the population, uh, is not available to us. But of course, we need to know more than just numbers. Or the, the actual situation of our churches. Um, and that leads into a question that uh, Peter had. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about the crisis of displacement in Syria and that's how that's impacted the Christian community there, if you know, uh, and how it's impacted NEST. The displacement of Syrians into Lebanon, you mean? Uh, just the ongoing crisis with uh, with Syria, uh, including displacement of Syrians into Lebanon, but also um, just in the churches in Syria as well. Yeah, well, um, there are about over one million uh, Syrian refugees in, in Lebanon. Now, the overwhelming majority of these uh, who are really refugees uh, and uh, many of them living in, in, in camps or refugee or tents or um, are not Christian and definitely not Protestant. Uh, most of the Syrian Christians that have left the country have either left through Lebanon to go somewhere else to Australia, Europe or somewhere else, or have come to Lebanon. But uh, sociologically speaking, Syrian Christians are middle class, 
um, they were able to arrange things for themselves either uh, with relatives in, uh, in Lebanon or other countries. So there is, we, we don't feel the impact of uh, uh, Christian refugees from, from Syria. Um, but of course, it's another question what the Christian churches, including the Protestant churches, are doing to the refu about the refugee crisis. And I'm sure you know that some of our churches, like the Presbyterian Synod, is running schools for uh, uh, Syrian uh, kids um, in, our, in our camps here. Uh, we have quite a number of questions uh, regarding your points about uh, mergers and possible uh, that you spoke about uh, the, the future of <laughs> of nest um, so let's see if we've got a, a couple of, uh, of things let's see uh, have you ever have you been in conversation at all with any u.s seminaries because there's a lot of there's been a lot of conversation in the u.s um, apparently, of, with freestanding sem Protestant seminaries merging with other institutions, have you been able to speak uh, at all with seminaries in the U.S. or in other parts of the world? Well, with some seminaries and faculties of theology all over the world, we have actual agreements of exchange. But um, a merger is is not, or or even uh, yeah, a merger is not possible with a, with a seminary outside our country. Uh, we we have to abide by the laws of our ministry of education and that becomes a, a, a you know there are all kinds of uh, legal uh, issues that are not easy to to solve but we have uh, uh, learned from experience of some uh, seminaries that uh, merged in the in the US and in uh, yeah mainly in the US and North America uh, trying to you know see how we can do something similar and along those lines, um, do you see any um, natural or logical partners for a potential merger in Beirut or in Lebanon? There was a question around the American University specifically. Well, the, the, the only ones that come into question really are the Lebanese American University, which was originally also a mission founded organization uh, university and still has uh, Presbyterians from the USA on its board but it's not, of course, related to the church anymore, or the American University of Beirut, or also originally a mission founded institution, and uh, the Armenian Evangelical University, Haigazian University. Now, as far as we can, we could tell, and we have made some contacts, uh, nobody, uh, none of the three except one is really interested in introducing relig religion to begin with, let alone theology, into its uh, structure. So Haigazian, is the, uh, which is the Armenian University, uh, is open to such uh, a discussion. But we haven't launched the discussion because our board has not yet um, you know, given the OK to, to do that. Uh, and then another question is, how can we as partners with NEST be of any help in your, your quest for a merger or the, reimagining the future of the institution? Well, at, at this point, I, I think this needs to be done by the people here. Um, they need to rethink about uh, what the future of this institution is uh, and what the implications are for a major change like this. Uh, I, I don't think there's an immediate role here for for uh, others uh, from outside the region. Uh, but once it happens or it starts, I'm sure we will need the support and the experience of uh, our partners uh, all over the world. Uh, and then to follow up on that is other than providing financial support in general, what can we do to support your work? Well, sometimes um, sometimes we need um, we need faculty for a short time. Uh, and this has happened before, of course, and it's still uh, going on. Uh, uh, one thing I did not mention is that uh, we also have hardly have any uh, local people interested in doing further studies in theology. You know, Arabic-speaking, Armenian-speaking people 
who want to do PhDs and come back and teach. So this also um, makes it a bit uh, uh, difficult for us to, to continue without uh, having local people teaching. Uh, and sometimes we are helped by um, visiting professors, uh, retired professors who can come and, and help. Uh, we always have this, uh, this need. Uh, encouraging student exchange programs is also one way where uh, our partners abroad can, can help. We are already doing this with some in Germany and in Europe, but with the US, it's, it's not as strong as I would like it to be. So there are so many seminaries there, but somehow um, American students are much more reluctant to, to, to make this big uh, step and uh, come on a big adventure. Of course, they shouldn't come now, but anyway, <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Once we can travel again, right? <laughs> yes. Um, and then a question here from uh, Nishan Bakalian, who I'm sure you know, because he's one of our mission coworkers in Lebanon. Um, so he's seeing that their churches, the Armenian evangelical churches, have an increasing, not decreasing need for pastors. So in your opinion, are there things that constituent churches could do in conjunction with NEST to present the possibility for pastoral work and the idea of uh, calling or vocation? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear what the churches are doing. I, I wasn't clear. There was a little interruption in the communication. What are oh. the churches doing? Um, so he was asking if there are, in your opinion, what can constituent churches and in conjunction with NEST do to encourage the idea of a vocation or a calling? Because they need more pastors in the Armenian evangelical no. church. We are willing to help in any way we can. But you know, the, the way I explained how students come to us, that they have to be chosen by their churches. And, and it's the pastors of the various congregations who spot somebody and encourage them and uh, direct them, uh, maybe advise them or inspire them to uh, go to seminary or for a career in the church. We're willing to help in any way we can, but it's really the, the task of, of the various pastors and churches to look for people and to well and to inspire people it's not just a, a matter of you know let's go and find somebody and brainwash them or convince them uh, they have to inspire them uh, by model and by words of course uh, to to want to do this and we're willing to help in any way they they uh, they require of us uh, we've had a couple of questions regarding uh, online learning and distant learning. So of course, right now with the, the pandemic, you have some online learning. So did you have any before the pandemic? Are you going? To, are you thinking about continuing this once we're uh, able to gather more with, once we have the virus more under control? Um, would you let people participate in some of your learnings from outside Lebanon? We didn't have it before. We have been we had been thinking about it, and some uh, seminaries here have been doing it as an option. Uh, we had been thinking about it, but now we we were forced to do it. Um, but um, we still need uh, Lebanon. Uh, the Ministry of Education, under under whose law we function, uh, except in emergencies like Corona, do not recognize. Uh, online courses that we teach or online degrees. Until that happens, we cannot take that uh, option seriously. But apart from that, uh, I think we are also discovering that uh, this hype about online education uh, is somehow uh, decreasing uh, because many of our students after last spring's experience and professors, you know, were not so uh, happy about this experience. Uh, it, it's just not, uh, it does not really replace uh, in-person uh, teaching, especially for, for theology where there has to be personal contact. But we will, of course, um, uh, once it becomes a legal option in, in Lebanon, we will uh, investigate how we can do it. We have a lot of problems to, to solve in that, uh, by, in which language do we teach? 
you know, uh, online education for the region here has to be mainly in Arabic or slightly in Armenian for some uh, for a group of people. Uh, but our language of instruction so far has been English for many, many, many decades. Uh, and our resources are all in English. And uh, we will have to solve some of these problems before we can embark on a full uh, teaching uh, curriculum online. Uh, and then we had a question around the increasing number of students. Have you considered having students from uh, places where Christianity is growing in North Africa, specifically Morocco and Algeria? Um, yeah, well, we don't have connections there with churches there. Um, and my, my understanding is that a lot of that is underground Christianity, really, because uh, or house churches, so we don't know actually who to contact. Uh, now I know some other uh, non, um, you know, uh, not our seminary, but others. Uh, sometimes they uh, give scholarships to students from these countries, but uh, they're not really sent by churches, uh, and and some of them are um, converts from Islam. Uh, we don't have that avenue open uh, to us, but we would welcome it, of course. Um, but usually uh, these are churches or, or Christians that belong to traditions that are a bit uh, different from ours in the evangelical world. And I guess many of them wouldn't feel very comfortable coming to a place like, uh, like Nest uh, because of the idea of theological education. We, we follow one, one philosophy of theological education, which is not the idea of uh, we, we uh, educate or we train uh, evangelizers, evangelists to go and evangelize. That, that's, we train people for the churches, basically. Uh, and then there's a specific question uh, about your th theology. Uh, <laughs> so what is Ness's position towards the demands to abolish the confessional system? Would the Protestant voice be heard without it? Well, of course, our seminary doesn't have a position here, and uh, I don't speak for the seminary. Uh, we don't usually take such positions. But let me say uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the confessional system. Uh, if the confessional system means that uh, Lebanon is made up of many religious communities and these communities have to live together and they have to find a mode of living together and they devise something like a confessional system, this is not bad. Uh, because uh, the other alternative is, of course, um, a, a, a separation of religion and state or secularism which is uh, ideal for us. We have no problems with it as Christians, as Protestants, but our partners in this country and in the region don't accept it, the Muslims. So, so this is a, a, an option that is not open. So the confessional is, is a, a system, is a way of uh, a plurality to live together. Now, the problem with the confessional system is when it is abused by politicians, when it is exploited, uh, and and uh, uh, that is the problem that, that we have. But the fact of having confessions living together and uh, devising a mode of, of uh, life together is actually uh, 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 an enrichment and, and, and uh, a recognition of pluralism, which is hardly available in many of the countries around us. Uh, so we want to ask some more general questions about the situation uh, in Beirut currently. So there's a question from Michael Kinneman. What do you expect will happen with regard to the economic political crisis in the coming year? Can you get out your crystal ball for us and <laughs> see what's uh, coming on the future? Yeah, this is from Michael. Hi, Michael. Uh, I have no idea. And uh, we are as much in the dark as everybody else. But the only thing we see is that uh, uh, people who are ruling us uh, are not giving us any sign of hope. 
and they themselves are the cause of this uh, problem. Uh, and we are, I think, I mean, we are very pessimistic right now because we don't see a glimmer of hope. Uh, there is no indication that they want to change anything or they want to reform anything or they want to leave and allow others who are more qualified uh, to run the country. So I have absolutely no idea and I'm just as worried about my future and the future of the institution and everybody's future here as anybody else. Yeah, I was going to save this question for last, but you kind of led right into it is uh... <laughs> Where do you see signs of hope? Are you clearly are, you know, are not being feeling very hopeful at the moment. Are there some signs of hope anywhere that you that you have? Realistically speaking, I, I don't see any. Uh, th something has to change. So either either people who are ruling us here uh, have a change of heart or develop a conscience, uh, or something happens. But so far. Um, I mean, the only sign of hope, if you want, is that people are protesting. Uh, but even that has um, has become very weak in the last uh, uh, several weeks and, and and months. But possibly because of Corona, you cannot gather much. You can't have demonstrations. You can't uh, do big, uh, uh, you know, uh, gatherings and protest and do things. Uh, because Corona is spreading like wildfire in Lebanon. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, Nest's response to the explosions beyond the repairs that you've made to your building? Have you done anything else in response? Yes, we, we have uh, we have engaged in um, well, actually, in in uh, uh, helping some uh, of the displaced people with uh, mattresses. We have donated mattresses. We have donated. Uh, parcels of food. We have cooperated with uh, some churches in uh, giving uh, clothes and uh, actually kitchen utensils. Um, we've coordinated this with, with others. It's not just us. Um, uh, and at the beginning of the explosion, some of our those of those who were here in the building, some faculty members and students and staff even went to uh, some places and help uh, clean uh, the debris, clear the uh, clean the, the glass and and so on. We still plan to do uh, some things, but of course in the lockdown you can't do uh, you can't do much. And and we did. Uh, I should mention uh, those employees and students whose homes were uh, hit by the explosion. Nest uh, repaired these homes, uh, these places for them at our expense, of course, from the donations that were given to us by our partners all over the world. Uh, and just for the attendees, I've put a, a link in the chat that looks at all of our partners' responses to the explosion. So there's a, a link right there. Um, it's the, the response to the August 2020 explosion in Beirut. So if you're, uh, if those of you watching are interested in learning about what some of our other partners in the region uh, have been doing in response to the explosions, you can click right there and you can see some, some updates there. Um, we've got only about two minutes left. So maybe I'll leave, if you've got any, any final parting words, Dr. Sabra, if you wanna say anything specific, I'll let you do that. And then I'll turn it back over to Peter to close us out. Apologies, we couldn't get to all of the questions. We had so many good questions here. Um, and uh, it's, I will also, before I let you close, I'll note in the chat, we've got a, a link where you can donate to support the work that Nest has been doing. Um, and we in Global Ministries, 100% of the, the donation you've made will go directly to uh, our partner. So I just to want Dr. to say, Sandra. I just want to say a big thank you to all those who stood by us and still are. I just looked at the list of participants here. So many of them uh, have are our friends and partners and have actually donated. It was really, um, we are uh, so grateful for the way people stood with us, by us, and are still doing so. And if there is a sign of hope for Nest is that we have friends like these and partners all over the world. So thank you again very much to all of you.
I'd like to add my thanks to all of you who are uh, viewing and participating in this webinar today. Uh, it's a delight to, uh, to see your names and to, uh, to know your support for NEST and for the church globally. Uh, George, we would like you to know uh, that uh, we continue to hold you in, your, in our prayers as you continue to lead NEST. Uh, we hold NEST's faculty and staff and students the constituent churches, the region, uh, all in our prayers. Uh, this is a, a challenging time uh, for you and for the world at large. Uh, we stand in solidarity and, uh, and we are with you. Uh, we are grateful for uh, your sharing today. Uh, you have given us great insight into uh, the state of, of Protestant theological education uh, and have given us some uh, of your ideas for uh, how that may uh, develop and continue uh, in the region. And we're especially grateful for that insight. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for sharing your time and your wisdom. Uh, and we, uh, we continue to hold you in prayer. Uh, we're thank very you. happy thank for you. this opportunity. Thank you. God bless you. And you too.